What is going on? And welcome back to another episode of iCoach Nutrition Radio. Today's topic, we are going to dive into emotional eating, stress eating, um, kind of this binge cycle, if you will. Um, I want to start this off with, I am not addressing, and I'm not speaking to uh, those that actually have a eating disorder. Uh, this is not targeted towards um, you know, anything that has to do with, um, you know, an actual uh, eating disorder, right? Um, so I just want to, you know, kind of kick this thing off, starting with that. This is all around kind of solutions for just the general person that that struggles with stress eating, with emotional eating, um, you know, kind of some of these, these methods that you can use to stop the cycle of emotional eating or stress eating. Um, this is, this is not, uh, you know, something that I am speaking to an actual eating disorder. This is not, you know, somebody with anorexia, um, bulimia, anything like that. So again, I just want to uh, let that be clear and let that be known before even diving into the podcast here. So let's kick it off with this more than 60% of clients say that they struggle with emotional eating or stress eating, right? And this, all of this, this is actually before the, uh, you know, before COVID, right? And before the, the global pandemic there that, that we experienced. That's what this data is based off of. Um, and so just know that if this is you, you are not alone, right? This is something that most people do struggle with. So, you know, whether it's out of stress or anxiety or sadness or boredom or grief, it's understandable why we turn to food for comfort, right? Food offers a pretty great, if, you know, very temporary solution to our suffering, right? Eating feels good. It sets off kind of a, a cascade of pleasurable sensations that make it easier to forget about, you know, these, these uncomfortable emotional experiences that we may be going through. So, you know, think of it this way. When you stress eat, you're using food to solve a problem. Only it's a problem that food can't solve, right? And so most people who experience emotional eating feel trapped and guilty afterward, which just kind of perpetuates the behavior. So, you know, if you're somebody that, you know, struggles with stress eating or emotional eating um, and you're looking for solutions, right? Well, then these strategies that, you know, they, they these can definitely help for sure. Um, and not just, you know, not just uh, during something like COVID and a, and a pandemic, but, but all of the time. All right. So these are kind of this three strategies for dealing with stress eating. All right. So one of the, you know, one of these strategies or multiple of these strategies might resonate to, resonate with you more than others. Um, but I encourage you to try out each, you know, each one of them, right? And see what works best for you. So number one, the number one strategy here, and these are no, not in any particular order, but there's three different rounds, right? So, so the first strategy here is to develop awareness around what triggers your overeating. Okay, I'm going to go into each one of these a little bit deeper. Number two is provides tools to help when your triggers are activated, right? And then number three helps you understand that your behavior around food doesn't define you as a person, all right? And so going through these three strategies, the result of this is going to allow you to have a variety of different methods that work together to tackle a complex problem, right? And hopefully, uh, you know, it'll help you to put, to put you back into the driver's seat when you feel out of control. Okay, so when we look into these different strategies here, right, the, the, the first strategy is to go ahead and overeat, right? So our brain likes patterns, and many of our thoughts, emotions, and actions actually happen on autopilot. So they're part of sequences our brain know what, uh, they're part of uh, sequences um, our brains know well, right, from years of practice. So those sequences just need triggers in order to take place. So in the presence of a trigger, your brain dictates a given behavior, like stress eating, without requiring any conscious decision making on your part, right? And food cravings also work, you know, the same exact way here. 
So the physical sensation of hunger is the most obvious trigger. That stomach grumbling, right? Slightly shaken, right? Even like, you know, vegetables sound good sensation uh, is one that you can trust, right? To tell you it's time to eat. But stress eating usually comes after other types of tri triggers, right? Things like, you know, sights or smells or people or emotions. So for example, you might find yourself hitting the Girl Scout cookies hard every Saturday afternoon. You're always left wondering how it happened and why you feel so crappy about it. All right, the process is so automatic, you often don't have any idea what's triggering it. But if you really started paying close attention, you might have an epiphany, right? It's also the time you talk to your mom every week, right? Mystery solved. So here's a wild idea. Give yourself permission to overeat. It's going to feel counterintuitive at first, uncomfortable even, right? But view it as a learning experience, which is another necessary step in the process, Plus, there are you know, always worse ways to learn. All right, so here's how to try it. Next time you get the urge to stress eat, treat it as an experience, right? Or treat it as an experiment, sorry. Use your behavior awareness, right? To, and, and, and I'll share this here, but it's, a, it's essentially a behavior awareness worksheet to document what happens and how you feel before, during, and after. And, and an important note here, right? This is a judgment-free zone. So this process will help you identify triggers, but it's also, but it'll also start removing or at least lessening any guilt or shame you feel around overeating. So often if you're allowed to overeat, it suddenly doesn't feel as urgent, right? When it's no longer forbidden, right? The intense craving for a whole box of cookies sometimes turns into a more manageable desire for just one or two. So try to observe your experience as neutrally as possible. And if you're having trouble, imagine you are a scientist collecting data on someone else, right? Afterward, review over the worksheet, right? What do you notice? Is there any patterns or aha moments that stick out to you? Maybe you notice, uh, you know, you head for the snack cupboard right after getting off a stressful two hour long conference call. Um, and you realize you were, you know, you're, you're doing that almost every day for weeks, right? It's possible you'll have this experiment, experiment a few times before the trigger or triggers become obvious, and that's okay. If this happens, do your best not to obsess about the decision you eat or not eat. Instead, try to focus on learning more about your own behavior and keep your worksheet notes handy so you can add them as needed. Once you're aware of the trigger, decide what to do about it, right? Decide what to do about it. If it's something you can avoid, great. If the smell of bacon cookies is too much for you to handle, you can take a break from baking for a while, right? If your trigger, if your trigger isn't something you can change or avoid, sometimes just being aware that you're experiencing a trigger can help. And that'll signal it's time for strategy number two. So strategy number two is to create a nourishment menu, right? And this is a technique that I use with clients, uh, even with myself, right, to help deal with stress eating or emotional eating. So pick a thing before the thing. That's essentially the idea here, right? And it might sound odd, but you, you need to do you know, exactly that, right? So pick an action, a thing, right? That you'll always do before you engage in stress eating, which is the other thing, right? So I, ideally it's multiple actions, like a menu of choices for yourself, right? These actions disrupt the trigger slash behavior cycle, but there's more to it than that, right? And so I call it the nourishment menu because we're deprived of so many things that nourish us on so many different levels right now. <laughs> oh, excuse me. It's allergy season. I tell you what. Um, so example of this, right? How much fresh air, um, our examples, right, would be like as much fresh air as we want, right? Social interaction, free movement, right? Food is an easy way to fill some of the voids we're filling Right. And that's why it's important to have ideas of things that can nourish you in other ways. For example, before deciding to eat, you could take three deep breaths. You could drink a big glass of water. You could mentally check for signs of physical hunger. You could play with your pet for five minutes. You could do some quick stretches. You could listen to your favorite song or a few minutes of a podcast. You could go for a short walk. You could spend a few minutes on housework right? Like folding clothes or organizing your desk. The most effective nourishment menus include actions that line up with your goals and values, right? 
these things will be more likely to offer the same filling or relief you are hoping, right, consciously or not, to get from food. So, for example, if you deeply value your close friendships, uh, you know, calling or texting a friend could be one of your menu options. All right, so here's how to try it. You might be thinking, sure, that sounds nice, but I won't actually do it. Right? And it's true. The trick of the nourishment menu is that you actually have to use it, right? And so here's three ideas that might help. So number one, make it easy as make it as easy as possible on yourself. So ensure the items on your nourishment menu feel doable and reasonable. At maximum, they should take you 15 minutes to complete. For instance, a quick journaling journaling session could qualify here. Ideally, you want to have one or two options that'll take a minute or less, like writing down you know three emotions you're feeling in the moment, right? So, um, you know, so that's that's one example. Another one would be like giving your partner a hug, right? You'll also want to keep any materials you'll need handy. Right. And so if drinking a glass of water before eating is on your menu, always keep it at your desk or wherever you are. If you're supposed to write something down before you head for the pantry, keep a notepad and pen on your kitchen counter. If you want to eat a serving of vegetables before having any other type of snack, um, you know, keep washed or cut up options at eye level in your fridge. Number two, put your nourishment menu somewhere visible. So post it on your fridge, kitchen cabinet, or anywhere else you're likely to, uh, to see it before eating. You're less likely to ignore it if you can see it. And if you can ignore it occasionally, it's not such a big deal. The key is to get a little bit better over time, not to be perfect. So if you use the nourishment menu once every third time you want to stress eat, you're still making progress. For the record, just doing one action from the menu is often enough to break the cycle, right? And so you don't always have to work your way through the whole list. It's just good to have multiple actions to choose from for variety's sake. And if you try a couple of options and still want to eat, that'll happen, right? But remember, you've, you've already done some really good things for yourself in the process. So go ahead and have that snack, right? If you go that route, right, treat it like a meal. Right. And so portion out the amount you want to eat in a bowl or on a plate, sit down at the table without distractions and enjoy it slow, slowly and mindfully. Number three, keep track of how often you use your nourishment menu. Right. And record what happens when you do. Right. So let's say over the course of a day, you get the urge to snack four times. Twice, you use your nourishment menu and avoid eating. Once, you use the nourishment menu and end up eating something slowly and mindfully. Another time you skip the menu altogether and end up overeating, right? So why do we do this? At the end of the day, you can look back and see which actions, which actions helped you stop the stress eating cycle. So then you can start proactively taking those actions regularly throughout your day, and this will help you to make progress. All right, so strategy number three, take a self-compassionate approach for a change. So nothing, you know, like when you think about these, these situations, right, it makes sense you might not be eating, right, or exercising or working or living, right, um, you know, and, and well, let me, let me bring it back. So feeling bad, right, feeling bad about being out of your routine can make stress eating worse, right? And so if you need help getting back into a health and fitness routine, right, well, then you really have to, you know, think to yourself, right, the, the, the you know, the perfect time to start practicing self-compassion is, is now, right? You have to know when to give yourself grace. You got to know when to push yourself, right? So self-compassion is an attitude of generosity, honesty, and kindness to yourself, right? Beating yourself up and, 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 and you know, like making yourself feel bad, that, that is not a, a positive strategy, right? You only have so much energy to deploy. So you need to make sure that 80% of your or, or more of your time and energy is being spent on something that is, is positive, right? Something that is, is actually that you have control over and is that is actually serving you. All right. So, I mean, look, if, if some of this stuff feels a little, you know, woo woo to you, then that's fine. Right. Bear with me here for a second as I'm working through this. You know, lots of people who deal with stress eating have negative self-talk running through their heads before, during, and afterward, right? And so some of this might sound familiar. So here's some examples. 
I guess I'm going to hit up my snack stash again now, like I always do. Why can't I ever learn? Oh, I'm such an idiot for doing this again. I just had to finish the ice cream, didn't I? Nice work, me. Right. But here's something surprising. There's evidence that negative self-talk, the opposite of self-compassion, signals your brain to release dopamine. Right. And dopamine is involved in habit formation and the addiction pathway. So that's not great. Right. As a result, the cycle of negative self-talk, stress eating and feeling bad about it can become a never ending loop. Right. So are you noticing a theme with how our brain works? Self-compassion is a tool that can help interrupt that cycle, right? And, and no, you know, we're not trying to, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to trick you into joining some commune, right, where, where we spend our time holding hands and being nice to ourselves, although, you know, would that really be so bad? No. <laughs> um, but there is research to support this approach. Right. So what do these studies suggest? The practicing self-compassion can help reduce the screw it mentality. Right. Feeling that happens right before a person starts to emotionally eat. Um, So, yeah, you can work on stress eating by being nice to yourself. And importantly, self-compassion doesn't mean giving yourself a free pass to eat whatever you want. Right. Self-compassion is giving yourself a break. It's being honest and seeing the big picture. It's being kind to yourself. Self-compassion is not giving yourself a permanent get out of jail free card. It's not ignoring your problems and it's not letting yourself off the hook. So how do you practice this strategy? What does self-compassion look like in practice, right? So there's three main elements to focus on here. Mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. Mindfulness is defined by, right, this is, this is when you are aware of what you are doing, thinking, feeling, and experiencing, but you are not judging yourself for it. Common humanity is defined by acknowledging that you are not alone, that everyone goes through what you are dealing with at some point. And self-kindness is defined as being generous and decent to yourself. So when you are about to stress eat, try to interrupt the cycle with some self-compassion and kindness. Right? Here's what that might look like as a mindfulness aspect here. I'm so anxious being cooped up in my house right now, and those chips are really calling my name. Common humanity, that's okay. Plenty of people have a hard time saying no to chips. Self-kindness, take a deep breath. Whether or not I choose to eat right now, it's going to be okay. It works during and after stress eating too. So an example of mindfulness, I'm pretty feeling I'm feeling pretty guilty right now. This sucks. Common humanity. A lot of people are probably feeling this way right now, and that we're all spending, you know, more time at home. Uh, and again, a lot of this is coming from COVID and, and lockdown and all this, but this, you know, these have application strategies, you know, even outside of that. And then the last one there is self-kindness, although, or, all right, shake it off. So you ate some chips, it happens, that doesn't mean anything about who you are deep down. So a key distinction here is that self-compassion isn't an excuse to stress eat, Its purpose is to help remove some of the guilt you might feel about stress eating. That's important since that guilt can be just, uh, it's important, that's important, right? Since that guilt can just lead to more overeating. So give it a try. Even if it feels a little, you know, woo-woo at first, right? It might just be the thing that works. All right, it's totally normal to to, to be feeling all the feelings right now. And remember, it's understandable to look to food to deal with those feelings. Food provide us with, provides us with joy, comfort, and sustenance. We associate it with good memories, big life moments, and meals shared with loved ones. We might even use food to help define ourselves and our jobs, our cultures, our relationships. But the more we use food to bury how we feel, the worse those uncomfortable feelings get. Right? And like Robert Frost wrote, the best way out is always through. Is it the easiest path? No, but it's always, right? But it's the only one that will provide relief. And that's something we could all use more of right now, right? Our brains and lives for that matter tend to work in cycles, but the stress eating cycle, it's one you can opt out of. So I hope this helps. Again, I will link the uh, the reference there that I spoke of in the beginning uh, here um, in the comments section here in the Facebook group. Um, and outside of that, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your week. 
Thank you always for listening. Um, and until next time. Thanks, guys.